after many many years later, maybe we we will look back. We recognized, oh, that's the moment when everything changed. In five years, AI is going to literally be in everything we do. As humans, we have to, first of all, understand that this is going to happen. Many technologists try to solve human problems using technology when actually what we need are human solutions. The deeper question is, what does it mean to be human? What are the things I'll still be proud of? I find this moment extremely profound because it really forces us as a humanity to think through exactly what consciousness is, what makes humans human. There's a whole lot at stake here. Careers, unbelievable amounts of money, and who gets to shape the future. Already begun. A global race for supremacy in the age of artificial intelligence. China, the United States, and the European Union are vying for economic growth, political influence, and power. So are the big tech companies, and startups are hot on their heels. For those who lose, there'll be no second chances. Jonas Andrulis founded one of the most influential European AI companies. With his help, the European Union could catch up with the world's AI leaders, become independent from the US and China, secure a prosperous future. This is a watershed moment for Europe, the last roll of the dice. If Europe wants to decide how to use technology in accordance with European values, then it has to be able to build that technology itself. Thomas Wolfe co-founded Hugging Face, a major open source AI platform. He wants to stop one of the most powerful technologies in human history from ending up in the hands of a few corporations. What we need is a multitude of players, not just one that owns AI. We don't want a future where such a fundamental technology is in the hands of a single company. There are plenty of films where that's the mark of a dystopia, one company that controls everything. Han Xiao is a Chinese AI entrepreneur. He wants his company, Gina AI, to be successful on both the Western and Chinese markets. So what role do Chinese AI companies play in this global race? And how is the Chinese Communist Party using them to achieve its political goals? ChatGPT or GPT-4, it basically serves as a brain. And uh, this brain cannot be made in the US, right? So this is some worry that uh, the Chinese government has. The culture of each country, right? how each government runs this country, will eventually be reflected into this brain. It is absolutely clear that at the highest levels of leadership in the United States and in China, artificial intelligence is viewed as foundational to the future of economic and military power. We've created an economic and financial system that's based on the assumption that everything is going to keep running smoothly. We get cheap gas from Russia, the Americans look after us so we don't need to spend money on arms, China is always friendly. We've gotten comfortable. And now we have to break out of that comfort and say, we can go on the political offensive again. We can compete. We can create competitive conditions here. We can make sure that the cool companies we have can also grow and play a role in the global market. That's already been made clear. At the end of 2023, German Vice-Chancellor Robert Habeck made significant progress towards these geopolitical goals. Aleph Alpha, a German AI company, raised around half a billion euros from investors. 
It was one of the largest rounds of European financing for artificial intelligence technology, and it was a signal that the European Union can produce elite players in the field of AI. Aleph Alpha's founder and CEO is Jonas Andrulis. He's given priority to investment from German industry, SAP, Bosch and the Schwarz Group, which owns supermarket retailers Lidl and Kaufland. I was an amateur radio enthusiast. I soldered radios together and built my own antennas. Early on, my father had computers at home, so I was able to start programming and playing around with them at a very young age. When we started out, the term generative AI didn't exist. Hardly anyone had heard of open AI. We were very technical. We managed to create category-defining innovations. We were just nerds, researchers. And there were times when I felt like I wasn't coping with the amount of work and the challenges. Every night, I could answer emails until I was so tired I fell off the couch. And there were still things I was neglecting, which I didn't want to neglect. In spring 2023, the European AI landscape was a lonely place. With his startup, Aleph Alpha, Jonas Andrulis had built the only generative AI that could compete at an international level. He'd acquired the expertise from his work as a high-ranking AI researcher at Apple. Suddenly, he'd become one of Europe's great hopes in the global AI race. Aktuell. Right now, we simply can't cope with the onslaught of potential customers and partners. Most of the German stock index companies have been in touch, lots of medium-sized companies. There are briefings, press engagements, events, an unbelievable amount of stuff. It's like the Cambrian explosion right now. An incredible amount of new and creative things are emerging. We're the only Europeans to be involved on this scale. It was an exciting development. We also had things like OpenAI, and maybe ours were even cooler. What is missing and what I think deserves more attention in the EU is, is why there are not more uh, domestic companies that actually grow and scale. So a lot of company leaders, startup uh, innovators end up going to the US and the access to capital is really one of the main challenges. If you look at what we did, it's enabling technology. What I need for that is a carefully selected, effective team of brilliant researchers. Then I need money. More money than you normally get as a German startup. These days we're talking about billions. And then you need partners to help you, the kind of help that money can't buy. Open AI doesn't just get 10 billion from Microsoft, it also gets incredible support in integrating its technology into all Microsoft products and platforms. At the time, Aleph Alpha had 60 employees at various locations. Most were at the company's headquarters in Heidelberg in southwest Germany. Unlike OpenAI, Andrulis wasn't gearing his AI towards private users, but rather industry and the public sector. But they tend to be sluggish and not easy to win over. That posed a challenge for Jonas Andrulis. He needed pilot projects to prove his technology works. You stand here and you're greeted by a virtual person. Hello, may I help you? Where do you want to go? Then I can use the screen. We have to keep moving in this direction. That's not good. That's my job. I know it is, but we're very happy to still have you. She'll probably be taking her well-earned retirement soon. It's become a standard question. I ask if you'd like to stay on a little longer, because I need you and because there aren't enough skilled workers coming in. It's a big issue. That's important for us. Solidarity. And of course, the main topic is innovation. 
Heidelberg is one of the first municipalities in the world to introduce an AI citizen assistant using a language model provided by Aleph Alpha. We have a partner, a customer, with whom we can look at these new technologies. They also act as a testimonial for us, because anyone can go and try it out. That's a huge advantage, because a lot of our customers don't want to be named right now. They don't want people to know exactly what they're doing, so it's great to have a pilot customer with a bit of vision and courage. The hope is that in the long term, AI will improve public administration and speed up services. I just enter a question. Motor vehicle traffic on the B37, which is a busy road. Then I get it to search. Of course, that's a very general question. The question now is what point in time, whether we're talking daily or annually. Of course, the AI has to work out what the user actually wants. The B37's closed between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. Now I can ask, how do I apply for child benefit? That wasn't the right answer. It can't find anything now. So the error messages that we get back from the public and from tests we do ourselves get passed on to Aleph Alpha to figure out what needs to change to make the inputs more accurate. It's always about the accuracy of the input. The technology is still in the test phase and not yet reliable. 2023 was a delicate time for Aleph Alpha. Jonas Andrulis needed fresh money from investors. Meanwhile, Microsoft and OpenAI were gaining more of an advantage. In fact, a race starts today, and we're going to move. We're going to move fast. And for us, every day, we want to bring out new things. On March 14th, 2023, OpenAI released ChatGPT4, the most powerful artificial intelligence to date. At the same time, it greatly reduced costs for users. For Jonas Andrulis and his team, it was a threat to their business model. To write a poem about fly fishing from the perspective of a fish. Poor. Okay. <laughs> and it goes on for hours. It's huge. Oh, wow. In the depths where shadows weave and play, in this cool, clear waters where I stay, I am the fish beneath the silver stream, where life's a dream, or so it seems, a wily being, sleek and sly, with ancient instincts to live and die. <laughs> yeah, goes on. Yeah, well. Yeah. They see the essence not, not of my that heart. Bad. I went to an apartment with a number of colleagues, and we watched on a, on a big projector screen the announcement of GPT-4 someone had a chat GPT Pro account so they could use GPT-4 and we could play with it. And we were like very impressed and surprised by how good it was. It's not upsetting when someone comes out with a great piece of technology because we're researchers and building technology and that's how it is. You know, when you're a violinist and you go and you watch uh, an amazing solo by an incredible violinist, you don't feel, oh, I... <laughs> You know, I should, it's, I'll give up. You know, it's inspiring. I was a little stressed out. Yeah. I was in the middle of conversations with potential investors, business partners, and I knew that in every conversation I was, I was going into, somebody would say, but GPT-4. I would have wanted to build GPT-4 myself. Two years ago, get 200 million, be the first model at that level of capabilities out of Heidelberg, out of, out of Europe. It caused a lot of frustration in the team, and I, I saw that. That's painful to see. <laughs> in fact, comparing OpenAI with Aleph Alpha was absurd. OpenAI was almost half owned by tech giant Microsoft, which had pumped over $10 billion into the company. Jonas Andrulis had raised just 28 million euros. Still, he wanted to take them on. We're all under enormous pressure. We're fighting for survival. We've created something world-class with a lot less money. We're basically at the forefront on the highest level. 
Und wissen aber alle, But we all know that there's now a wave of Microsoft money rolling towards us, and we can't do anything to stop it. While Jonas Andrulis was feeling the heat from industry top dogs Microsoft and OpenAI, Thomas Wolff was more relaxed. He co-founded Hugging Face, which has 200 employees and offices in Paris, New York and Amsterdam. The company has built a successful platform where programmers and companies can share AI models and further develop them. The philosophy, the mission and the values that we push are actually very European by some way. Uh, being careful about the data, uh, trying to build something responsible, you know, and not just go fast and break it. There are definitely Anglo-American values in ChatGPT. We wondered whether we could set up a project to analyze and document that. For example, with benchmarks that could show whether a model has Anglo-American, French or German values. It would be interesting to do a comparative study between ChatGPT and BloomChat, wouldn't it? If you ask ask a question in different languages, how different are the answers depending on the kind of question? Is the approach more American or European? That would be an interesting study. When I talk about pluralism of values, I mean that every population in the world has its own value system. We have a lot of different nationalities here, and we have to ask ourselves, what are our values? What's important to us? Uh, optimistic sparks in Europe, like new startups, uh, in Germany, Aleph Alpha is already, I would say, a big player. In the UK, stability is obviously a very visible player. Here in Euro, in France, uh, there's Mistral is new player. In Finland, so in, in almost every European country, I see at least one or two like startup with this uh, this ambition to become and to to build something big. As idealistic as Thomas and his team from Hugging Face appear. There is also criticism. Open source or not, the end result is that a small elite of tech professionals is determining what our future looks like and what risks we're exposed to. All the businessmen I meet me All the business people I meet say, we need education. Society has to educate itself. We only create the systems, but you can design those systems in different ways. For example, you can make it so that a person can understand what's going on, at least a little. This could be one of the obligations we impose on the industry. These machines have processed all cultural knowledge and were created by mathematicians who don't know anything about culture. That's a bit of an exaggeration, of course, but we have to find ways of explaining this to people who aren't interested in the math. They just use the machines as tools. They need to understand where the limits are, in which situations the machine will or won't work. Just like with GPS devices, where we recognize when they give us the wrong route. Isn't it great that such a huge research field is opening up? Uh, but there's also a huge gulf opening up. Who's actually responsible in the end? Because as a developer or researcher, you have a certain responsibility. It's not about restricting research. But when there are applications that are harmful to society, we have to be aware of that. There is a huge potential for manipulation. Just think of the influence of ChatGPT on elections. I think there needs to be an antidote, more education. That's a good topic for the upcoming elections. What education do we need to stop us being manipulated?
C'est une très grosse question. Que se passe-t-il quand les gens commencent à That's a big question. What happens when people start asking AI who they should vote for? Because the AI will give them an answer, as it always does. Who decides how it answers? Who should decide that? Unfortunately, I have no answer to that. J'ai pas de réponse. Pas de réponse à ça. Generative AI is developing at breathtaking speed, and tech giants are battling it out in the ring. That's spurring development even more. There's a massive new market up for grabs. Leading AI experts worry that big tech, in its eagerness to compete, is creating technologies beyond our control. I think we've made a mistake when my Swedish countryman uh, Carl von Linnaeus branded our species as Homo sapiens, because sapiens means the thinking Homo, the, the smart one, right? We're not going to be the smartest anymore. Maybe we should rebrand ourselves to Homo sentience, the feeling human. We can feel curiosity, meaning, purpose, love. That is what really makes us unique. We should ask, how can we keep control over the machines so that we can use them as tools to build a world where we, where we can really have human flourishing with positive experiences. In 2014, when I founded the Future Life Institute, it was quite taboo to even talk about AI safety at all because that would imply that it wasn't totally safe. And a lot of AI researchers thought that it would be bad for funding and that only weird people worried about this. It was very much like a coming out of the closet moment for people to sign this letter and say, oh, you too are worried? <laughs> Think we should slow down a little bit? Oh, I didn't know that. And then it suddenly became become socially acceptable. Max Tegmark and his Future of Life Institute published an open letter warning that artificial intelligence posed an existential danger to humanity. Civilization itself could be under threat. The letter was signed by hundreds of AI researchers and tech industry leaders including Tesla boss and ex-owner Elon Musk, Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, and Turing Award winner Joshua Bengio. And it's been quite shocking that once we put this letter out and kind of a who's who of AI researchers signed it, and the conversation really exploded. My worst fears are that we cause significant, we, the field, the technology, the industry, cause significant harm to the world. I think that could happen in a lot of different ways. It's why we started the company. I think if this technology goes wrong, it can go quite wrong. And we want to be vocal about that. We want to work with the government. I think he was serious about that. Uh, I think that's uh, kind of, so he was talking about these existential risks. And I also believe there are existential risks. There are also a whole spectrum of other risks. And I know of some, I talked to him a, a couple of times about this. You know, he very much recognizes them as well. On the one hand, of course, these warnings about the major power of this new technology also uh, amplify the significance of the products that these people are building. So it could also have an indirect marketing effect, right? Like look at the incredible things that we're building. But also let's make sure that nothing goes wrong. And for that, they look to the politicians. The net effect of that could be that if, heaven forbid, something goes wrong, they could say, well, we warned you, but the politicians did not act or they did not act in time. So I'm looking at a paper here entitled Large Language Models Trained on Media Diets Can Predict Public Opinion. This is just posted about a month ago. This work was done at MIT and then also at, at Google. The conclusion is that large language models can indeed predict public opinion. I'm, I want to think about this in the context of elections. Should we be concerned about models that can, large language models, that can predict 
survey opinion and then can help organizations, entities fine tune strategies to elicit behaviors from voters? Should we be worried about this for our elections? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Senator Holly, for the question. It's, it's one of my areas of greatest concern, the, 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 the more general ability of these models to manipulate, to persuade, uh, to provide sort of one-on-one -on -one, uh, you know, interactive disinformation. I'm nervous about it. I think people are able to adapt quite quickly. Uh, when Photoshop came onto the scene a long time ago, you know, for a while people were really quite fooled by Photoshopped images and then pretty quickly developed uh, an understanding that images might be Photoshopped. Uh, this will be like that, but on steroids. And the, the interactivity, uh, the ability to really model predict humans well, as you talked about, uh, I think is going to require a combination of companies doing the right thing, regulation and public education. Twenty twenty four is a crucial election year, not only in the United States but worldwide. There will be European Parliament elections. There will be elections in India. I mean, it's a large amount of people in the world will actually go to the polls. And while we are living in this big experiment where it's very hard for independent researchers, journalists, civil society organizations to probe these models, that we may only find out, you know, what the what the harms and and malign uses as a weapon against democracy were when it is too late. Shortly after Sam Altman appeared before the US Senate, he co-signed a statement along with a number of high-ranking executives from Google, Microsoft and other tech companies. The fact that it was the companies who themselves were asking for this type of regulation, and it was the leading researchers who were asking for the, the government to get involved, that really was the turning point in the conversation. To understand the effect that generative AI was having behind the scenes of global politics at the time, you have to travel north to a small Swedish city called Luleå, around 150 kilometers south of the Arctic Circle. When people say that artificial intelligence is gonna be like the next industrial revolution, I think they're underestimating its impact. It's not just gonna be a new technology like the steam engine. It's like building a new species, a species that's much smarter than us. President Biden himself was having meetings on artificial intelligence, uh, in some cases, as often as three times per week. And I will tell you that not very many things get on the president's calendar for three times a week. May 31st, 2023. The sirens and motorcades descending on this Swedish coastal city gave a sense of how much was at stake. Leaders came here to discuss nothing less than how humanity should react to the arrival of this new, albeit artificial, form of intelligence. What role should politicians play? Democracy needs to show that we are as fast as technology. You saw the first letter on, on asking for a course of six months. You saw yesterday a number of very, very insightful people signing up to say you need to do something for the very existential risks. And then you have the non-existential risk uh, as well. Why is it important for the European Union to have a common policy with the US concerning AI? And shouldn't other parts of the globe be included in the conversation? Europe is important, but this is bigger than Europe. US is important, but it is bigger than the US. But if the two of us take the lead with close friends, I think we can push something that will make us all much more comfortable with the fact that generative AI is now in the world and is developing at amazing speeds. Jonas Andrulis was also invited to the top-level meeting in Sweden to represent the views of European AI startups and call for fair competition. 
gibt natürlich andere KI-Unternehmen in Europa, aber Of course, there are other AI companies in Europe, but we're the one that's keeping pace the most with the global leaders. I assume that's the reason why we're here, not because we're so charming. Kind of change coming in some industries. Yeah. How do you feel about that? We can raise more capital. Yeah. Um, I think we have two two weeks ago I was at Sapphire Conference, SAP Sapphire Conference, mm -hmm. and Christian Klein on his opening keynote he kind of said our key partners for generative AI are Aleph Alpha, Google, mm -hmm. and Microsoft. Mm, nice. Um, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and then I'll I'll have events coming up with with HPE with Antonio Neri. I what agree. do you think about uh, the our colleagues on the other end here from uh, Anthropic and their uh, <laughs> latest um, uh, th statements, etc. Oh, so the, the statements on like safety or... Um, yeah, they're like yesterday and so on. It's Long term, it is possible to conceive mm -hmm. catastrophic events. I've had Brussels and Berlin and they basically are, are scared. We will start uh, with uh, Jonas Andrulis, who is the founder and CEO of Aleph Alpha. The floor is yours, and thank you very much for being with us today. All right, thanks for having me. Um, I think we are all like a little bit dizzy. The speed uh, of change, like everybody I know that is in AI is kind of stressed out. And uh, with this technology, we are only even just stretching the surface. I fear that knowledge work is an important part of what is happening in Europe. So this is a an opportunity for us to, to build new empires, to build new value, but it's also a risk that we're losing a substantial pillar that we're standing on. Thinking about how we can, um, how we can make this a fair um, playing field, because I think it's in everybody's interest that Europe will contribute to a safer future in AI. While the US and EU were trying to come up with a common strategy, on the other side of the world, in China, an artificial intelligence ecosystem was emerging with its own set of rules. AI is a key part of China's efforts to become a global power. I always remember my mom and my dad pushed me to this Olympic school in order to get specialized in mathematics and also English school. It's like a extra work besides this regular school work. So basically you have to take the lessons on Saturday, on weekend. It makes me a quick learner. And my mom is correct, right? So uh, in order to keep progress, in order to keep pushing yourself, you have to keep learning. And I always, I always tell my employees also to keep learning, uh, to keep up this fast pace in AI. My father was a professor in uh, computer science, so I am very lucky to get in touch with AI in the very early days. Back in 2009, I was trying to build some AI models, very simple AI models. Nowadays, if you look from today's large language model perspective, that model is like a very simple, simple like a small ant. Han Xiao has worked in both the East and the West. He's held positions at the Chinese tech giant Tencent and German online retailer Zalando. Three years ago, he founded his own company. Gina is an AI startup with offices in Shenzhen and Beijing. But its headquarters are in Berlin. Oh, we are doing another interview here. Why? <laughs> yes, for the website. For the website? Yeah, we we'll have, have the internship program with interns, and now we okay. want to add also like employees' experience, yes. so people can see how it is to work at Gina. Yes. Not only from an intern perspective. Yes, I see, I see. So, Kalima, of course, are from India. Uh, Isabella from South, South Africa. Yeah, from South Africa. Uh, Aladdin from Tunisia, right? Uh, Jackman from Malaysia. Michelle, finally from Germany. <laughs> 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 
have a limited amount of wires, right? And so I can only power one monitor. And so like sometimes I really need to like show people the architecture and like also show people the results of the model. And so it's nice that I have like this second uh, screen where I can draw on it as well. So like it basically becomes touch screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So this is basically showing the progress of training the model. It's kind of like a stock market, right? I see this model performs relatively good because you can see it's increasing over time. But sometimes it's not very uh, successful. For example, this one, this model start very high, but then the progress kind of stops. That is wasting our time, it's wasting GPU resources, energy, and so on, right? Han Xiao and his team are working on optimizing AI models for specific applications. For example, linking text, video, and images. Their goal is to make communication between humans and machines more intuitive and natural. A lot of people may recognize this. This guy, this is a, this is a kind of grandpa meme, right? So it's very popular on, on social media, right? So if you upload this picture to the algorithm, uh, it will generate have a story. It can generate uh, comedy, erotic, <laughs> fantasy, horror, all this kind of story. So we just keep it default and then we just do. It wasn't supposed to be like this. I was meant for more. He whispered to the room, his words echoing into silence. I am more than the lonely man I've become. More than these disappointments. Suddenly, his eyes glinted, a revelation forming within his mind. Perhaps it is time I showed the world that again. With strengthened resolve, Arthur placed the coffee down, marking an end to his solitary reflection and the beginning of a new chapter. So uh, basically, this is what you can do when you push multimodal AI into an extreme, right? So you can see from a single image, you are able to generate not only a text description, but an emotional audio story. Eventually, Chinese company will be in the leading position in this generative AI. Two months ago, I was participating in this uh, World AI Congress in Shanghai. And during that conference, there was uh, 30 large language models uh, released in, on one day. Some from big companies like Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu, uh, some also from like uh, middle-sized companies from uh, different industry even, right? For example, from bank. Chinese companies are usually very good at learning from U.S. company, right? So they kind of copycat what U.S. companies are doing and then make it even better. I don't doubt that one day you will see uh, one of the top models in the benchmark, in the leaderboard, are actually from China. The question of which companies will dominate the age of artificial intelligence has real geopolitical consequences. China is using the expertise of its tech companies to expand its power. Western nations, meanwhile, are trying to counter this. My name is Jeffrey Kane. I was a longtime journalist and foreign correspondent in China. I wrote a book called The Perfect Police State, and I was an advisor to the US Congress, to the House of Representatives on sanctions and Chinese politics. From what I have seen around the world, in China and elsewhere, I am deeply concerned that we do not know how to manage AI yet. We do not know what's coming. We do not know how to rein in this technology and put it to the good use of our democracy. China has been leading in bringing technology under state control, and in fact using it as an instrument for state power, whether it is for internal control and censorship uh, grip on society, 
or whether it is their global ambition to have digital infrastructure around the world and uh, to work with uh, countries, for example, I think about the African continent. It is, of course, a vision that is at direct odds with that of democratic societies. In 2017, uh, China's national strategy for artificial intelligence, and this is a public document, uh, set out the explicit goal of dominating global AI technology. And so I think the United States has explicitly set the goal that we are not going to assist China in rising as an AI-enabled authoritarian superpower. Ironically, in the past, it's been large US companies that have undermined their government's policies in order to gain access to the massive Chinese market. Foremost among them, Microsoft. Microsoft is the most pivotal and important Western company operating in China that has helped the Chinese government develop its AI dystopia. Microsoft set up an office in China called Microsoft Research Asia. This was a gesture from Bill Gates back in the 1990s because he wanted to guarantee stronger market access to China. This uh, laboratory has gone on to train the who's who list, the superstars of the Chinese artificial intelligence world. Many of the key people in this uh, laboratory have gone on to found companies such as MegV, SenseTime, um, or either, either found them or they've taken on very senior roles in them. That was like the uh, incubator of the modern Chinese internet or AI industry. A lot of great people, great researchers, startup founders actually come from Microsoft Research. And those talents are now becoming kind of the uh, very, uh, very big influencers, opinion leaders, and really like entrepreneurs in China. Yeah. Microsoft helped build China's tech elite. This in turn has been used by the Chinese government to create a gigantic surveillance state that operates with the help of AI. Like in China, in Beijing and Shenzhen, you can find the most CCTV camera in the, in the world, right? So, and uh, uh, to be honest, like a general public uh, get used to it. Right? So they don't see this as intrusion to their own privacy or having a software that analyze their behavior, you know, uh, because the, uh, the kind of the narrative there was to protect them, right? Uh, to make the society more secure, right? Provide, uh, protect from terrorists and so on. Right? So in general, like the, the public over the last 10 years has already accepted the fact that there are surveillance everywhere. And now, not only you have an option of listening to all the information that people exchange in society, now you also have the cognitive capacity to process all of this. So that's a scary, scary uh, future. Unfortunately, it's definitely not an impossible one. Right now we have like over 500 city brands across the country. That means one city is just like Shanghai. They have a lot of big data analysis center they're collecting all this data from different areas and they have the machine, they have the algorithm like centralize it and, and do the uh, computation analysis and making all these decisions. The Chinese government has used all forms of AI so far. They see AI as an extremely powerful tool that they can use for, for the military, for national security, for state surveillance, police work, um, also the management of cities, uh, traffic. And they have been selling these same technologies all over the world, especially to authoritarian governments with the promise of total surveillance and um, a nation free of crime, free of dissidents. It's a brave new world because we have not yet found a solution to this in the West. China is forging ahead. The US is pursuing its own interests. And the EU? It's striving for independence. If Europeans don't play a part in shaping this future technology, then it will be American or Chinese AI that will penetrate our lives to an unprecedented extent. 
It will know us as well as our closest friends and relatives. It will communicate with us around the clock and influence our thoughts and actions. To prevent this, the EU needs companies that can not only program, but also build their own hardware infrastructure to keep highly sensitive data safe. The most precious commodity, the, the, the most important resource for the future of generative AI is GPU power. In other words, computing power. In the future, it will be as essential as electricity and water have been for developments that have taken place in the past. There is already a saying in Silicon Valley, the GPU poor, the people with fewer graphics cards. Training high-end AI language models requires thousands of high-performance graphics cards, which is also why supplies are scarce. That's another reason why many smaller players ally themselves with large tech companies. A lot of the deals in the field of generative AI in recent months have come at the cost of independence. Many companies have partnered with large corporations by accepting restrictions on things like hardware selection, cloud selection, integration. We absolutely didn't want to do that. Early on, Jonas Andrulis recognized the value of having one's own hardware. He built a data center for his company in Germany. For that reason, Aleph Alpha is becoming increasingly strategically important for politicians. The media talks about you as Germany's answer to chat GPT. Is that right? Yeah, this is false. Also, einfach weil that's wrong. You could say Germany's answer to open AI. But ChatGPT is a product aimed at the consumer. It's really intended to help school kids do their homework or to write a poem for grandma's birthday and things like that. That's not our target group at all. We want to go where the most complex and critical processes are, for example, in the financial industry, in administration, in security, in healthcare. That's where we want to build systems that assist and support people. We are in a government ministry here, and public administration could benefit enormously from AI. We have an incredible number of processes that could be systematized and carried out. So the focus of my work here was a bit like asking how the public sector could act as a mainstay consumer. Generating work, if you can put it like that, which would create demand for German and European AI technology. I mean, it's an AI company that targets the public sector, and we are the public sector. So we only have to see that we generate opportunities for these technologies to be tested, be it through customer experience, funding decisions, or even permits. We talk a lot about regulation and that kind of thing, but if we continue to be dependent on foreign countries and commercial enterprises for this essential technology, then in the future things could potentially end up like they did with energy, like with gas recently, where we wanted to say certain things, but we couldn't, because otherwise it would have gotten cold and dark around here. The data center that so far ensured Aleph Alpha's independence comes from U.S. company Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Hewlett Packard Enterprise is one of the biggest players when it comes to setting up computer infrastructure. They build data centers. They set up internal server rooms. A lot of the high-quality infrastructure on which the modern world runs comes from HPE. Andrulus secured a strategic partnership with HPE, giving him access to hardware without tying him to the company exclusively. 
He also hoped it would help him gain a foothold in the U.S. market. He finalized the deal in Las Vegas with HPE CEO Antonio Neri. Welcome to HP Discover 2023. This event is special because, because it is our annual opportunity to reunite with a global community of customers and partners. We are announcing our heute. We're announcing a major joint project with HPE today. There will be a press release going out simultaneously. It'll be a big joint market venture. That's the important thing. Not that I'm going to go on a stage, but that we're now taking a joint step with a major partner. Am I nervous? Maybe a little. We've been working towards this for months. I'm sure it'll go well. What is the competitive advantage of your model eventually? So, I mean, we, we, we're building our model like we have an independent tech stack, so we're not relying on any kind of external dependencies. We recently solved explainability in a new way, so you can not only see positive, like confirming sources, but also disagreeing sources. You, you share with me an example of yes, that. Yes, yeah. exactly, right? Or from your own kind of speech. Um, so I think this is. There are analysts here, so be careful. Yeah, well. Americans move fast. They're willing to take risks. But of course, this partnership also has to benefit HPE. And any partnership can come to an end at any time. Jonas Andrulis wanted to avoid becoming dependent on a large corporation, as with OpenAI and Microsoft. But that strategy brought with it a major risk. If his technology doesn't keep up with the competition, he'll be out of the race. We'll have more money soon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, 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 I also want to... I'm hoping, I, that, I'm hoping that yesterday helped a little bit with that. Like, oh, it's, yeah, it certainly didn't, didn't, uh, didn't hurt. Yeah. Uh, and I've got some kind of feedback from, like immediate feedback like after the show, like from, from investors on my, on my cell phone. Um, and I, of course, I want to I want to kind of put this money to work. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, well, I think I think if we can get your help, um, if you've got if if we could get your help to really say, okay, these are the, the application use yeah, cases. Yeah. I think if we can get that list, you know, from from you, um, and then we can turn around and look at, okay, one, how do we package it? Two, how do we, you know, can we use it internally? Yeah. Um, I think that would be great, you know, and then and then obviously three, how do we you know, how do we make sure we line up the services offer? Thanks again for the partnership. Great to see you. Thanks a lot. I think what always attracted us to the, the relationship was Aleph Alpha's mission was to enable enterprise application use cases for, for LLMs and multimodal models. And most of the, the customers in the Valley or most of the, the companies in Silicon Valley were much more consumer oriented. So this concept of a single tenant LLM that can be trained with your data for your application really fits our core customer base. For all their friendliness, Andrulis knew the Americans wanted to see concrete results. He had to deliver, and fast. show you anger. I have a smile for you. Are you happy with the trade fair so far? Ich bin sehr zufrieden. Viele Menschen kommen vorbei und wollen mit mir sprechen. What's been most interesting? Das interessanteste Gespräch bewegte sich möglicherweise um die Kommunikation zwischen Mensch und Roboter. The AI race is also a competition for attention. It's about catching the eye of investors, sitting on panels, being noticed, being quoted. We've already heard from a few masterminds on this topic today, and there are still a few more to come. With you, we'll be asking to what extent AI itself will drive innovation. This once niche technology is now the subject of massive hype. 
Jonas Andrulis is suddenly in the spotlight. His AI is being tested and evaluated, not always favourably. News magazine Die Zeit accused Aleph Alpha of allowing its AI to be provoked into making racist and chauvinistic statements. Andrulis pointed out that its basic technology has deliberately not been restricted. Low-hanging fruit for journalists. That's just low-hanging fruit for journalists. I took a screenshot. The model used a bad word. Every time I fine-tune the model or tune the instructions, that diminishes it in certain areas. It loses capabilities in exchange for me making it more pleasant or safer. And those might be the exact capabilities that I need in an industrial context for automating processes. We want the embedding technology to become a well-known brand, just like the iPhone. That's the most important thing. Don't think about whether it makes sense or not. We want to become a company like OpenAI, the top provider in the embedding world. I was talking to him about the upcoming plan, because we are going to release a, a new product which is a kind of a competitor to OpenAI's uh, embedding uh, platform. And uh, uh, so we were just uh, kind of discuss what are the, the best way to kind of push the team to focus on this product, right? Because there is also like, a, you know, with the, we have team with different cultural background and uh, sometimes it's very hard to kind of organize everybody to concentrate on one thing. Uh, this is also because the AI is developing so fast and a lot of hypes are here and there and people you know, want to try this out, try to try that out. So I just uh, talk to my CTO and make sure that all the senior engineers, senior leaders are kind of on the same page. For me as a CEO, my primary job is actually killing the fun, right? Killing the fun part uh, by, you know, killing all this distraction to make sure that people concentrate on the single mission to make this company a success. We are kind of developer-driven company, so most of our customers, our users are actually developers, are software engineers. So for example, right now there is, a, there, there is a Talendo sitting there, right? And their engineering team is also our customer. The biggest challenge is, <laughs> the, the competition in AI is just too intense. The investors are not stupid, like most of the investors, especially when it comes to later round, investor has a very strict evaluation about this company. So the, the companies that we are competing with, uh, such as, you know, Hacking Phase from France and uh, 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 Cohere from US. So those companies are not like uh, those guys, you know, previously work at Google, you know, or uh, graduated from MIT, Stanford. So they are very smart people. So most of the investors will look at us as not as a small company, but they will evaluate us with more, not based on the hype, but based on the performance of the company, right? So that's, that means we, all, we, we have to show two things, either the hyper growth of the user, so we need to grow the user base uh, super fast, or uh, we show them a solid revenue. Summer 2023. Thomas Wolfe has managed to make time for a family vacation in Brittany, France. As chief scientific officer, he's primarily responsible for research and development at Hugging Face, a job that allows him to take a break from time to time. What are you up to today? Anything special? We're practicing sailing with the trapeze. Didn't you do that yesterday? Yes, today we'll do something else. Meanwhile, Thomas's business partner, Clement de Long, is in the spotlight. He's the CEO of Hugging Face, the public face of the company. 
tech industry heavyweights like Google, Amazon, NVIDIA and AMD have invested $235 million into Hugging Face. The open development platform for AI models has become a billion-dollar business. <laughs> the company gained even more prestige when Mark Zuckerberg's Meta used Hugging Face to publish its high-end language model, Llama 2. It's a model that was released by it's a model that was recently published by Facebook, or Meta. It's similar to ChatGPT, an open source competitor. The difference is that it's free. You can just install it on your computer. You don't have to access it through the ChatGPT interface or pay for it. It's like a set of Lego. Everything is open. Everything is freely accessible. You can also buy it pre-built. If someone builds an open source model for you, it's like they're building Lego for you. A beautiful sports car made from Lego. And then it's yours. You can open up the hood and look inside. The greatest advantage of open source, its free accessibility, is also its greatest weakness. What if a model was developed further by criminals, terrorists or other bad actors and used to cause harm? Any security mechanisms built into a language model can easily be removed. That's a big question we're asking ourselves at Hugging Face. In the beginning, our aim was to make this technology as widely accessible as possible. We thought it would help lots of developers, but there are two sides to the technology. There are some people who can access it, who really shouldn't be able to. There was a guy I met last year who uh, had an AI designed to develop medicines, molecules that are good for your health. And just as an experiment, he put in a minus sign and trained it to look for molecules that were bad for your health. And within four hours, it discovered thousands of chemical weapons, including VX, the most uh, powerful nerve gas that we here in the US have, have developed. You know, So you, of course you shouldn't open source things like that. It's just crazy. I'm a scientist. I love open source, right? And it's undeniably, if you think about the pace of progress, how do you get, make sure that there is like the most progress? Open source is your friend. Having said that, I just cannot completely ignore all the dangers. And of course, the argument, the only argument I have seen so far from supporters of, of open sourcing everything is saying, well, we will figure it out. It's easy to comment from the sidelines, to simply warn that it's all dangerous. It's more difficult to actively get involved, to try to create something positive, something good. It won't necessarily be successful. There'll be mistakes and then fresh attempts, but I'm going to try. It's risky, but we'll follow the path we think is right. MIT is one of the most renowned tech universities in the world. It has close ties to industry. The research carried out here has the potential to change the world. Needless to say, MIT is at the forefront of artificial intelligence. In addition to his work with the Future of Life Institute, Max Tegmark is a professor here. The topic of AI security is part of his day to day. So we want to ramp up the effort and pace at which we do things. And um, it's also very inspiring whenever I go to Silicon Valley and meet the various companies there, how quickly they do things often compared to what we do in universities. So I thought it'd be fun to, <laughs> now we have a whole, we're lucky to have a whole bunch of, of talented people here, so we, we, can, we can wrap up. Tegmark and his fellow campaigners want to keep a close eye on the tech startups from Silicon Valley, uncover risks and use scientific methodology to show people just how little time we have left to counteract the pull of the tech industry. So you've been working very hard on finishing our paper. We yes. had a very, very long conversation yeah. about it yesterday. And I thought, I thought the very last part of the 
of what we talked about might be kind of fun for the whole group. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Do you want to draw that table uh, yeah, on the board? Sure. And maybe they can of course. So, contribute uh, some good quotes for it? So, like, we basically, as you know, uh, modeled the conflict between, like, the movement to replace human livelihoods and maybe replace humans, period, uh, versus, like, the movement to resist this and to preserve the status quo. So this doesn't just come, it's not just something Peter pulled out of a hat, it just actually comes from the math. So if you're naive, like, oh, we have AI that can do everything a human can do but better, uh, my life will still be good. So we call that naivete. Uh, so, so if a lot of people believe this, then they will not invest personal sacrifices and personal costs uh, to greater unite and be in a, for the movement to be in a better position to resist as a team. There's um, companies and open source developers that are working day and night uh, with the goal of you know, taking people's income streams by uh, creating AI models that are better than them at the, their job and their capabilities. So once you lose your income streams and your leverage, like it's too late, the, your options are more limited. The biggest danger is that we'll look back in 20 years and realize that we've automated everything because it was so easy and because it worked and the AI behaved correctly in 99% of cases and suddenly we no longer have control over something that's crucial for society. The process has already begun. Until now, it's been the intellectual and creative abilities of humans that have set us apart from other creatures and machines. But what if those qualities are now being taken away? My name is Dr. Inango Lumumba Kasango, AKA Samus. I'm a rapper, I'm a producer, and I'm an assistant professor at Brown University in the music department. Initially, I wasn't sort of tapped in to all of the discussions that were happening around AI. Of course, peripherally, I was sort of listening, watching, reading, um, but I, I really started to tap into these conversations when I noticed what was happening at the intersection of hip hop and AI. And that's when I realized, whoa, this thing is moving really quickly. I mean, last year we were talking about a sort of AI generated rapper. And this year we're talking about rappers like Drake and um, artists like The Weeknd having their voices actually sort of cloned using AI technologies. And so the, the speed at which this has become sort of an immediate challenge for working artists is very um, alarming. Ultimately is the logic of capitalism and as a human creator what you can do is try not to be left behind. As a Chinese we always feel that like technology if you use it in a smarter way it can like push you uh, uplift you yourself to become a smarter, greater cre creator. You know, machine and AI could do the job faster, cheaper, and they don't have strike, and you know, they don't resist any uh, like ri ridiculous demand from the clients or from the bosses. And I can see that Chinese companies are already like using it to replace human labors. So I think this is a very critical moment right now for the creators around the world. So this is something happening and it's gonna be big in the next three to five years. So for folks like myself who, you know, I've, I've been able to build a life for myself, but I would definitely not say that I'm in the, the sort of like top tier of the music industry there's a way that I think we're able to skirt under the radar and continue doing work as we're doing it because it's so much about experimentation. It's so much about trying out weird things. And AI is so much about averaging. It's the people who are invested in um, playing in that space of the anomaly and playing with the unexpected who will sort of continue to thrive. The impact of artificial intelligence on our society is far-reaching and complex. 
How can we regulate a technology that's developing so quickly and whose potential is almost impossible to gauge? The United States is struggling. Here in Washington, the tech industry's influence is huge and governing majorities are fragile. The fact of the matter is that the US government moves slowly. It is a democracy. Um, that, that slowness is built into the system. The US government is not supposed to be efficient and not supposed to be able to tackle problems quickly because a government that is too efficient you know, can use that against its own citizens too. I think that we've now reached a state in our society that many philosophers and, and writers in the 20th century warned about, which is the inability to govern technology due to the increasing pace of change. Well, I, I certainly would not bet against democracies, um, but it will be a really tough adjustment period. The first major piece of legislation aimed at regulating artificial intelligence on a far-reaching scale came from the EU, the AI Act. I definitely kind of really admire the European Union for being essentially the leader in this space. They took on this kind of regulation very seriously before anyone else really thought seriously of that. Jonas Andrulis has come to Brussels. Together with other startup founders, he wants to let politicians know that strong regulation could put smaller European players at a disadvantage compared to the competition in the US and China. Meetings like this are always a bit difficult because you say your piece and you never really know what reaction you're going to get. A few new people will listen, and of course it's clear that cooperation within Europe and with Europe is important, but it's always hard to say how much we can achieve here and now. Do you have documents? I could just talk. I've prepared something. It's your session. You can decide where you want to sit. No. So good afternoon to all of you. I'm pleased to welcome you to the European Parliament, uh, to this uh, meeting, an important meeting uh, at the right time. Something that will happen, and we already see it, like basically a few steps down the road, is there, like the cloud, like the, the hyperscalers have done with, with cloud compute, there will be an infrastructure for general intelligence that all the value creation, all the apps, all the new innovations in the world will build upon. Um, and for, for us, there will be no second chance. If we cannot move fast, uh, then we, we won't be able to try again in 12 months. Thanks a lot. Andrulis has repeated his message over and over again, whether on international stages, to German politicians, or here at the European Parliament. Over the course of a year, networking and lobbying has become second nature to him. So I started my career as an investment banker and management consultant, wearing a suit in 38 degree weather with no air conditioning.
Ich glaube, ich wäre kein guter Politiker. I don't think I'd make a good politician. I realized that in my days at Apple. Wie groß ist die Erfolgswahrscheinlichkeit? What's the probability of success? Is it worth investing this time? Is it worth fighting this battle? I think so. I think it's a battle worth fighting. But I also have moments when I think that doing something else would be pretty nice. Shortly after his meeting with the European Parliament, it passed the AI Act. Ten or even five years down the line, it is this governance structure that will give Europe the ability to deal with the rapid evolution of AI and to reap the most benefits from it. And we have worked first and foremost to ensure our citizens' rights and freedoms are not just respected, but protected and strengthened. We don't want mass surveillance, we don't want social scoring, we don't want predictive policing in the European Union. Full stop. My name is Dragos Drake. I'm a member of the European Parliament, representing the Renew Group, the Liberal Group in the European Parliament. I'm a judge by profession. I was also a member of government in Romania, uh, Minister of Digitalization, Minister of Interior, prior to coming to Parliament. AI will play very much into that power balance. Why? Because it drives our economies, but not only. It becomes also a geopolitical factor, both in terms of how warfare is going to look like, but also how this technology will play into many of the processes that will keep one part of the world or the other competitive. And therefore, also the way you write the standards and how those standards become globally accepted standards is very important in that power balance that I mentioned earlier. So we're going to see very soon also, I think, a competition or possible clash in terms of global standards. And that is why we have to take measures to uh, protect our interests and also to make sure that, again, um, our understanding of the role of technology is, is one that is shared by as many on the global stage as possible. In renegotiations, Germany, France and Italy lobbied again to soften the rules of the AI Act, to protect domestic players like Aleph Alpha from heavy regulation. But in the end, the European Parliament prevailed. In terms of regulation, we're the economy that's leading the way. And there's a concern that that will take too much creativity out of the market. So in Europe, we're better at regulation than at putting technology on the market, unfortunately. The truth is it's ultimately going to be good for the tech industry as well to be regulated, level playing field. Even seat belts in cars were viciously opposed by the auto industry at first. But now, then when we got the law saying all cars have to have seat belts, they started to sell much more cars. Han Xiao has travelled to Shenzhen. In order to keep his team on the same page, the CEO has to visit the various company offices regularly. So you see that uh, there's red letters on the, on the building, that is uh, basically our office. Uh, but uh, we are not that big, we are just uh, one small room inside that big building. He wants to take his company Gina to the next level. That will require all his employees to pull together as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just put this down. I brought some waffles. Try them. They're delicious. I, I told them you have to eat now and make a happy face to the camera. Wow. 
when I work at Germany, people greeting each other, like uh, telling jokes, uh, you know, talk random stuff, uh, football match yesterday, all these kind of things. Here is more introvert. <laughs> I say the, the office is more introvert. It's just uh, like a different uh, working cultures. Both of them are pretty productive under my whip, right? <laughs> <laughs> I always think that a, a sequence of small success will make the team stronger and makes the team more confident on building things. Because larger success means larger hope. A larger hope could mean larger disappointment, right? Here in the startup, everything moves very quickly. Then we become a little bit stressed, we become a little bit nervous because, you know, we could lose the advantages against the other competitors, against the market, and so on. Right? It's not about what we did, it's about uh, how people perceive us, right, on, on what we did. In the meanwhile, in Germany, there is also a team that are working on releasing a new large language model. Yesterday, the leaders told me that this model can be ready on Monday, but it has been postponed for many times. So I have to see like how it goes right now. Yeah. In the evening, Han Xiao has another meeting with a potential investor. On the way, he calls his technical director to ask whether the launch of the new language model is going as planned. Hey, Wang Nan. Hey. Hey, Wan Nan, your embedding platform has to get into the global best model list. This company won't succeed unless everyone does their best. If you don't get into the top 10, it'll be much more difficult. Who uses a platform that's not in the top 10? You need to think more about these practical things. Is the LinkedIn post done? The Twitter post? There needs to be a strategy here. Okay, that's it. Bye. We want to, you know, get into the top 10 model, uh, a leaderboard. Our models get into the top 10, but you know, the, the team just told me, the German team just told me they probably cannot get into the top 10. That's why I get a little bit like, uh, you know, uh, intense on my, on my conversation, because I said this is something that we promised uh, to ourselves. You know, in this world, it's very, very attention-based world. And uh, if you cannot get into the top 10, it's just like, a, even if you get into like number 11, right nobody cares right so this is why you know i'm telling the team that it's not about engineering only you also have to think about the whole company like the marketing sales that all depends on the number 10 the top 10 models of this leaderboard Hi, Grace. Grace Liu works for a Chinese investment bank. The two first met a couple of years ago during the startup phase of Han Shao's company. You are just starting to bring AI generated content to people, right? Multimodal AI. We're working on two things right now. One is prompt technology, and the other is embedding technology. Mm -hmm. This year will be quite a challenge for you. We've made a new software with Prompt Perfect, aimed at developers. We've already got 200,000 registered users. Ah, that means there's a lot of demand. 
I don't think I can jump to my conclusion yet. But Han mentioned something very interesting to me about his new development and two new products. Actually, the most important thing is the CEO,、uh, him or herself, right? And、uh, whether he is a good entrepreneur, not only a scientist or a good developer. Meetings like this one put opportunities on the table for Han Shao's company, both in China and in the West. And there's good news about his important project. The new developer tool performs just as well as the equivalent technology from OpenAI. By the end of 2023, Jonas Andrulis has plenty to celebrate. He's completed a major round of financing. The company prevailed and convinced enough investors to raise half a billion dollars. That's money Andrulis is going to need, because competitor OpenAI is already triggering a new phase in the race for AI dominance. We did a lot of things that smart people told me four years ago they would be impossible. Build deep tech AI R&D out of Germany, impossible. Fund this with mostly European capital, impossible. Build our own data center, impossible. Contribute category defining research, impossible. And now we are entering into a new era, and I'm super happy to have you all with us. Um, yeah, and thanks for being here and help us make this the best party that Heidelberg has ever seen. Thanks. And for Thomas Wolf, quiet holidays may soon be a thing of the past. Hugging Face is now valued at 4.5 billion dollars, thanks to successful startups and the AI Act. The EU at least has a seat at the table alongside the U.S. and China. For now, for humanity at large, the question remains: What kind of world are we building right now for ourselves and for our children? I was holding my little baby Leo. You know, he just turned nine months old, and looking into his eyes and thinking that you know, right now, his language abilities are much worse than Chat GPT four. And he's never going to catch up with AI ever. I have two kids、uh, that are in middle school, and I'm thinking exactly about that. What I should teach them, about so they kind of prepare for the AI-infused future. How do we teach our kids to kind of build something like unique and individual? The machine is our sibling, it's our brothers or sisters. So we're working together. So I think that's that's how I feel. Même dans ces périodes charnières, dans ces périodes compliquées, les. Even in these pivotal moments, in these complex times, people always find a way. They're creative and resourceful. My son is already learning to code. He's really interested in AI. He wants to understand things and create things using AI. Our children will probably create a world that's completely different from ours. But I'm not worried. At the end of the day. I'm an optimist. Je suis optimiste, je pense au final. <laughs>